Hi, my name is Nick Robinson and I've been living in the Algarve for 21 years. I'm making a series of videos all about real life in the Algarve and what it's like to live here. Okay, so I'm just heading down to Faro to go and paddle with Josh from Expats Everywhere because he's in town for like two weeks, I think. And, um, well, they're in town for two weeks, which is great. And I just thought I'd show him around. You know, paddleboarding is such an amazing experience. He said he hadn't done it before, so we can go teach him how to do that. I mean, that's, to me, paddleboarding changed my life in the Algarve. Just, it's so amazing. To explore places by paddleboard. Wow. Wow, it's pretty bleak down here. Beautiful sunrise up there. And now it's all sort of like low cloud down here. I'm sure it'll clear soon. Forty thousand people live in Faro. Now those streets that you're walking on have been walked by humans since the fourth century BC. It was originally called Osunova by the Phoenicians. And it was the most important urban center in southern Portugal for agricultural products, for fish, and for minerals. Yep, those Phoenicians were miners too. From 200 AD, the Romans dominated. Then Byzantines came along, Visigoths, and the Moors eventually took over in 713 AD. When I say took over, I mean they took over viciously with a lot of pain and killing. King Afonso III retook Faro in 1249, again with a lot of killing. The Rio Formosa Nature Park was created in 1987 and it's considered one of the seven wonders of Portugal. Actually, the seven, one of the seven natural wonders of Portugal. Do you know what the other seven are? If you do, come on, hazard a guess. Just chuck your answers in the comments section below. I'd love to hear it. Now, the, the actual Faro municipality is divided into four parishes or Junta de Freguesia. The first one is Faro. Which the city of Faro is also called Se e São Pedro. And then there's Conceição e Estoy, which is just to the northeast, Montenegro to the southwest around the airport, and Santa Barbara de Neche, due north of Faro, up in the hills. And that's got a beautiful view down over the Rio Formosa. And you can see the airplanes taking off, and it's, it's actually quite nicely situated high up on a ridge. Faro is often regarded as the, as the sunniest city in Europe. It's got a great train station. Um, you know, just connects you with directly to um, Lagos. You can uh, take a train which takes you all the way up to Lisbon, and you'll be. You can also be in Porto by the afternoon if you leave in the early train. Great transport links, bus station as well. You can go to Seville directly, and um, so it's got great links. And obviously, there's the airport that'll take you anywhere in Europe um, directly. So the international airport. If you need to make connections to the US, you need to go up to Lisbon, but it's a quick 45-minute jump. Faro itself is kind of, I wouldn't say dirty, it's just a bit sort of sketchy. There's graffiti around and it doesn't feel like the prettiest city in the world when you get in. But there are some really pretty aspects to it. Like, for example, the marina, the Faro marina, and you, and you get up on top of Hotel Eva where they've got a beautiful pool and a bar and you can look down over the marina towards the old town. Um, and in the old town itself, there's some stunning restaurants called, like, for example, Tertulia. It's got really classic Portuguese and Algarvian food. And um, you can, there's lots of beautiful little places around there. And also around Hotel Faro, which is just to the north of the marina, looking back down over the marina. Stunning view, great coffee spot that you can get right up there and, and have coffee with a view uh, on their rooftop bar, basically. And then, you know, around there, as you're going further into Faro, there's some beautiful pedestrian calzada strewn streets and restaurants and uh, shopping like small boutique shops and coffee shops so it's really nice and it's, and it's interesting to see how faro has reinvented itself from within as, as a lot of people are saying using that word these days it's gentrified um, but it's uh, it's coming on but it's still a bit sketchy in places as i said graffiti a bit of a bit of litter and it's not the smartest cleanest most slickest place in the world but it's faro
So I'm sitting here with Josh from Expats Everywhere. How's it going, Josh? What's up, guys? Yeah, it's going well. <laughs> you enjoying the paddling so far? Love it. Yeah, You're yeah. a good teacher. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously originally from the States, and I can yeah. hear a Virginia twang there, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got my southern twang. Just kidding. I, I knew you told me you're from Virginia. So <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But um, so obviously you're here in Portugal now and there's a long journey between growing up in Virginia and, and coming here. Yeah. So just give us a quick breakdown. Yeah. So I grew up on the border of Virginia and Tennessee uh, in a small town called Bristol, most famous for an NASCAR track. And, um, I, you know, I was, I was really a kid growing up that maybe my parents never would have thought that I uh, would have moved out of the town, let alone the country. But uh, I got the travel bug in college, had a lot of teammates that were from soccer teammates that were from all over the world and had my first travel abroad experience uh, when I was um, in my third year of school. And I realized, hey, I don't get homesick. It's not so bad being away from my hometown and my family. And that's really what got my brain kind of going on. How can I visit other places? So um, degree wise, I have a master's in business administration. And then when my wife and I went to Spain, I got a master's in bilingual multicultural education. And that really launched uh, a teaching career for me for about 10 years before uh, my wife and I started the YouTube channel and kind of transitioned into that. Amazing, man. And you've been yeah. to like 80 countries, you said coincidentally. Or incidentally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a thing that we were kind of trying to do. It wasn't like uh, we were trying to collect stamps or anything. We just, uh, just never really liked to double back to places that we had been because there was always another place to explore. And we'd like to travel and with teaching you, you have a lot of free time to do that. So yeah, over 80 countries now. Cool, and this is the 80th country, maybe you've been here before, but what's the, what the focus right now on the channel is all about Portugal, right? And helping people to relocate here, is that right? Yeah, well, initially the channel was, uh, it's called Expats Everywhere, and we really wanted to talk to expats everywhere. We wanted to talk to people that were, were living, you know, in doing whatever job, but living wherever they were, uh, didn't matter, as long as they were more or less an expat. Um, and I know that that term's kind of a hot term among people, expat immigrant. Uh, we'll get into that later if you want. But, uh, <laughs> but basically, you know, the, the focus on the channel was about other people. And then we realized uh, after some YouTube consultations that, you know, maybe we needed to open up about our lives. And because our lives were, were so entrenched in our move to Portugal, and then now living in Portugal, uh, we've done we've done a bit of a shift, but we are going to get back out and start interviewing other people from all over the world, so people can be uh, anticipating that. But with all the people that you've met, all the expats that you've met, have you yeah. have you seen any similarities between the people? Like, is there a def definition of an expat, or a, are there? Do you know what I mean? Are there certain attributes that that expats have that other people don't? Yeah. Okay. So I guess we need to define an expat. So an expat to us is, is a much more of a standard definition where a person is moving to a place outside of their home country with kind of a temporary move in mind. So they're not moving to move there permanently. They're not looking to seek some sort of uh, citizenship or, or a permanent stay, right? So this is where maybe a retiree would be a little different because I think retirees do look at moving abroad and retiring there forever right and then that would be more of a, a retiree or or we could just say an immigrant and to me there's nothing wrong with with calling someone an immigrant it's just all about how you're saying it and to me it's not a derogatory term neither should expat be um, expat is not necessarily about living a high life it's living a life of mobility because you're moving every so ever so often you know um, so for yeah for us I think what we see with expats would be that people are are willing to try something out and and they're open to trying new things and they'll go and try things for a couple of years and then they'll go to another place and try that but what's the push is it dissatisfaction at home that's why they want to get out or is it just a, the lure of adventure that's just very dependent across the board uh, mm -hmm. on on individual people I mm -hmm. think some people move for economic reasons where a job might offer them more money abroad and then other people, um, they just want to explore new cultures. And I think for, for me and Kaylee, it was a bit of both. Um, we were able to not necessarily make more broad, but save more. Exactly. That's what yeah, I was about to say. The savings is, is really the key thing. So yeah. like, for example, as a teacher, you could be offered an amazing job, high paying job, I should say, in uh, let's say Switzerland, but the cost of living is quite high. Or you could be 
getting paid a, a relatively decent wage in Egypt, but the, the cost of living is really low there, so your savings rate is really high. So, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, so how's YouTube? Are you enjoying the ride? Love it. Uh, it's emotional at times, not yeah. going to lie. Yeah, it's emotional, like when you're tracking your analytics and you're seeing the, you know, the rise and fall of, of views uh, in a 48-hour cycle. Um, the but, common advice is don't look. <laughs> but you got it. Yeah, you, you got well, it. you have to look if yeah. you're if you're really intentional about growing and, and meeting the the audience the audience's needs, because essentially, even without the comment section, for example, you can look at what's happening in your your retention graph and be like, ah, right when I said this thing or I gave this cue or we talked about this aspect of living abroad, people dropped out. So you can look at that information and know to get out and, and stop talking as long as you're it. not wearing a mask a covid mask you're fine yeah that's right that's right that's, that's wanna... strange times right now oh, isn't yeah, it? it's crazy yeah, it's a very contentious issue so yeah we won't get into covid right now but josh thanks so much man it's really cool and it's fun uh paddle boarding with you right here thanks We've got for a couple of boards and... awesome <laughs> be nice if the sun was shining but hey So we're just sitting here with Josh in the Chelsea bar. There's actually quite a nice coffee bar. It's one of the best that I've found in the bar. Yeah, it's good. We have to see how good the coffee is. Okay, so I've got a metal. I uh, know I've got a you flat white. I got a flat white. Josh has got a, a what a medley. Medley with uh, a single origin from Colombia. Nice. But you actually ordered the Colombian as well. I did, but the difference between the two, because I didn't know what it was, was yeah. that I get a double espresso and you just get a single. I got a single. Yeah. So that's why you're paying a little more. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay guys, so I hope you enjoyed that brief overview of Faro and the chat with Josh because he's a he's a great guy and they're doing great things online. So go check him out. Now I just did a little bit of analysis on houses in the Algarve and in Faro in particular. So if you want to buy a T2 in Faro, I just looked at the first 14 items on Idealista and came up with an average of 200,000 euros and that's an average of 110 square meters. So that's in and around far. It's not like I haven't taken into account, you know, which floor it's on, what, what condition the apartment's in and where it's located. Because it could also be uh, in Estoy or Montenegro and outside, not in the city center. So it's just very rough. Um, and if you're looking at renting, there are a couple of things for rental on there. Generally a T1, which is a one bedroom apartment, goes for about 800 a month. T2, 910. T3, 940 and a T4 for about 2,000. So, you know, there's a, there's a large range there, but um, hopefully that gives you an indication of what's going on in Faro regarding real estate prices and rentals. If you need any help with real estate, um, I work with a great real estate agent. She's amazing. She's got so many good reviews, rave reviews. All the people I'm referring her to, which are quite a few, by the way, are singing her praises. So get on to ogarvalix.com and you'll see a link there um, for, for getting in touch with Keely. And you can just um, fill in the form and she'll get back to you. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.